In the early hours of Christmas morning, most people in Nashville were likely asleep in their beds when a massive explosion rocked downtown. Dozens of businesses and apartments were damaged, some heavily, and three people were hurt, though thankfully none seriously. Investigators say the explosion was an intentional bombing set off in an RV that was parked outside an AT&T building. They also identified this man, Anthony Quinn Warner, as the suspect and lone fatality in the blast. Or put another way, this appears to be a Christmas Day suicide bombing in an American city. But most major news headlines, though not all, seem reluctant to call it that. The media and the authorities also avoiding another word for this incident, terrorism. When we assess an event for uh, domestic terrorism nexus, it has to be tied to an ideology. It's the uh, use of force or violence in the uh, furtherance of a political social ideology or, or event. We haven't tied that yet. Now, it's true we don't know why Warner set off this bomb and it could take weeks to find out. Questions remain over whether he wanted to hurt other people. Police say his RV eerily played the Petula Clark song downtown before warning of the imminent explosion, giving them time to evacuate the area. But what if instead of an old white guy, the suspect were black, brown or Muslim? Would we see this much caution around using the words suicide terror attack? I would venture to guess Nope, not at all. Authorities have already pretty much declared Warner a lone wolf, surprise, saying there's no indication anyone else was involved in this incident, which seems like a pretty quick conclusion. Because as my MSNBC colleague Eamon Moyudin points out, if this guy was Muslim and happened to catch a taxi a week before that, the driver would be interrogated and have his life turned upside down for not knowing he was transporting a would-be suicide bomber. While President-elect Joe Biden said today that the bombing highlights the need for constant vigilance, President Trump notably still hasn't made any public remarks about the incident. Yet back in October, he very quickly condemned a stabbing attack in France. Yes, France, in Europe, foreign country, that left three people dead, tweeting these radical Islamic terrorist attacks must stop immediately. So yeah. There are still unanswered questions in the Nashville bombing, which could determine if it fits the legal definition of terrorism in the US. But it's still hard to ignore that Warner seems to get a benefit of the doubt from both the president and the media, not afforded to black, brown or Muslim suspects. Joining me now is Dean Obedullah, columnist for The Daily Beast and MSNBC. He also hosts the Dean Obedullah show on Sirius XM. Uh, Dean, thank you for coming on the show. The FBI is still investigating why Warner may have done this, whether his father's prior work at AT&T was a factor, what kind of explosive was used. Uh, but you tweeted about the very different questions that would be asked, especially by the media, if Anthony Warner were Muslim. Uh, it's nearly 2021. Why is this double standard still so hard to shake? It's remarkable, Mehdi, that we've had this conversation in years past and we continue to have them now. Let's be honest, Mehdi, I like the fact this is good faith nuanced discussion under federal statute and FBI regulations if this man is a terrorist or not domestic terrorism. If a Muslim man packed his RV with explosives to turn into weapon and mass destruction, drove to downtown Nashville, parked outside of an AT&T building, committed a suicide bombing, which damaged 40 buildings and hurt eight people, including police officers, there would be no good faith no discussion everywhere. It would blare in the headlines on news shows, terrorism, 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 suicide, suicide attack by yeah. ISIS-inspired, Al-Qaeda-inspired. So look, what they're doing is responsible. My point is it would not be responsible if this man was Muslim. We know that. There's not even a debate. They would not be responsible. Everyone would be calling it terrorism. And Donald Trump would be tweeting all day, maybe calling for changes in, in laws on immigration or whatever he can do to give more red meat to his base. Indeed. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's eerily reluctant uh, to comment on uh, issues like this, maybe waiting to see if the guy turns out to be a Trump supporter or not. Look, Dean, there's a legal definition of terrorism in the US, which is why law enforcement say they aren't using the term right now. But what's really stopping the media from using the word terrorism? Obviously, as you say, we want to be accurate. But do you think there's a language, not just a dependence on law enforcement for language, but a language that we have basically internalized, especially since 9-11, which is that terrorism must be a foreign thing, it must be a brown thing, it must be a religious thing. Absolutely, I mean, look at the words, and you show those headlines at the top there, and if you read the articles, the words that describe Anthony Warner are recluse, loner, 
he worked alone, and they hear about his family and what he has done. You want to see a subtle uh, indication of double standard? What is Anthony Warner's religion? Anyone? You don't know, because I don't know, because it's not mentioned, which means we assume it's not <laughs> so Muslim. True. If he so was true. Muslim, it would be yep. everywhere. You can't find, when you can't find the religion of the actor in an article, you know he's not Muslim, because if he was Muslim, that's the end of the discussion. Now, we know this. It's the end of the discussion, and it goes right to terrorism, and then you have the experts on air who say things like, how did he get radicalized? Where did he pray? Looking at videos of his cleric from 1997 and things that the cleric may have sent 20 years yes. ago and it radicalized now. This is the world we live in. And it, and what's wrong about it, it makes us less safe as a nation because then when you see the alarm bells of an Anthony Warner or the El Paso, Texas shooter who killed 22 people last year or the guy with the tree of light synagogue who are all white people, you discount these alarm bells. You say, well, these red flags are not really that alarming yeah. to because he's a white guy. It is making us less safe. So it's not just exactly. furthering a stereotype on us. It makes us less safe. And yep. last year, ATL, about 44 people killed on U.S. soil by extremists. 38 were by far right wing actors or white supremacists. So look where the threat is. It's right there. I mean, you're so right to raise the safety issue here because, look, you and I and many others have tried to make the moral argument about racism and Islamophobia, and we have got nowhere over the last 18, 19 <laughs> years. But the security, the self-interest angle is so important to stress. Even the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and we, we covered this on the show not long ago, uh, when the Christchurch report came out in New Zealand, looking back on intelligence failures there, she came out and said openly, as the report does, that, you know what, we were focused on a particular ideology, whatever you want to call it, Islamism, jihadism, whatever. We didn't look at white nationalist, white supremacist ideology, and that that's where this attacker came from. Trump, of course, around the time of the Christchurch attacks, I remember vividly, uh, was downplaying it. He said it's a small group of people. This time, he said nothing about the bombing so far as of right now when we're talking. Um, but we see him say so much about Black Lives Matter, Antifa, MS-13, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. He's, oh, he's not lost for words then. No, if this was someone in Black Lives Matter or Antifa, or an immigrant or a Muslim he'd be talking about. It. And I'm gonna give you one example of something. December 2017, there was a bombing in New York City, a crudely made pipe bomb by a Muslim immigrant. Uh, thankfully, he only injured three people. He burned himself, but he even survived this attack here in New York. What did Trump do? Before there was an investigation, tweeted, we must get rid of chain migration because the guy was an immigrant. He wanted a massive overhaul of our immigration laws. So he used this incident. Yet this man hurt eight people, including police officers, damaged 40 buildings, far more damage. It looks like he was targeting the AT&T building. Yeah. There's speculation why, why not? I'm not gonna get into it. We'll wait for that investigation to go on. It seems like maybe he had an agenda, but not even many more people hurt, much more property damage, and Trump is silent because this is who Trump is. This is the guy he is. We've known it. You've called out bluntly for years. I so appreciate that. And I wish others in the media, our friends, would say, you know, there's a time and place where you've gotta be blunt. The stakes are too high to play games and, I don't mean games like I, they're trying to – it's just the sense of, like, they won't go with the visceral response. And i got to share, Mehdi, I remember writing articles years ago yeah. about white terrorists and pitching it to network anchors who yeah. I knew who would go, well, I think the guy is mentally ill. I go, that's not even anywhere. You have literally shown me your bias. I'd say it in a nice way. i go, you're inferring it's a mental illness because he's a white guy. Until that's proven, we can't assume it. Nor can we assume every Muslim is cold and calculated. There actually are some insane Muslims who do things because no, they're Dean, Dean, insane. No, Dean, Dean, did you, did you not get... You, Dean, you didn't get the memo, did you? Muslims are immune uh, to mental illness. We have a special that's protection. Right. We can never be mentally ill. That never gets applied to us. Let me ask you this, though. You mentioned, you mentioned the important point about Trump and how he's treated different cases. You mentioned the example of the immigrant, although I'm trying to remember if he had a go at chain migration before uh, Melania's parents got their uh, residency here. But let me just stick to the idea of Trump jumping around and your point about people calling him out, because it's such an important point. I feel like in 2020, more and more of our colleagues in the media, more and more politicians, more and more people across the board are willing to call out Trump's racism, uh, his dishonesty, his incitement of terrorism. And the problem is we didn't do it earlier, as you say. And I want to play a clip uh, from 2017, I think we have the clip, uh, that infamous clip from the summer of 2017, Charlottesville, Heather Heyer is dead, Donald Trump comes out and says this. You had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. 
So that, for me, should have been the moment where we dropped any kind of pretense that this guy is anything other than an inciter of extremism, the far right, white supremacists, literal Nazis in Charlottesville. And yet we had a kind of, we got all worked up for a few weeks, it was a big story, and then we all just moved on again. And I feel like that was a moment where maybe we could have taken a stronger position then, and maybe, I don't know, we would have had a, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe we could have addressed this problem a bit earlier on, is what I'm saying. How about in December of 2015, when he called for a total and complete shutdown on Muslims coming to the country? Take a step back. The guy called for banning an entire faith group, and that was he was the leading GOP candidate at the time for the nomination. That itself should have been disqualifying to our nation, and it wasn't. Two thirds of Republican voters backed that; they were on board with that. That's where that that's where the GOP has been, my friend. So, look, the media, some like us, and I think more minorities in the media were very blunt and candid in calling Trump out for the threat that he was because we got it. Um, you know, I have friends in the Middle East who saw him and were saying, hey, I've seen a guy like this. He's the dictator in charge of my country right now. So, you know, we had friends warning us about this type of thing. I I've been clear-eyed. You've been clear-eyed. Others have. I think some were applying the old rules of journalism to a man who did not abide by any rules whatsoever. Forget journalism about decency, about common the idea of common sense on just like compassion and empathy he lacks so much. So look, he's gone. I'm going to tell you, you might hear a similar speech January 7th, Mehdi, not to scare people, but January 6th is the day Congress is going to meet for the electoral votes. And Trump has already called for protests that will be wild, his word, wild. Who knows? I hope nothing violent happens. Hope it's peaceful. You might see violence. The next day, Donald Trump goes on TV and defends those because if they're supporters of his, he will defend anything they do so, from shooting paintballs to the Kenosha shooter. So, Dean, let me ask you this before we run out of time. You, uh, uh, you wrote an article uh, for MSNBC.com, a very, very interesting article a couple of weeks ago, uh, making the point that Barack Obama had uh, some anti-Muslim policies. Donald Trump amplified, extended those, as you mentioned, Muslim bans, some horrific things. What is Joe Biden going to do to uh, fix it, if anything? What, what, is, what, is, what is this whole terrain going to look like under Joe Biden? He talks about healing the country, but what right. are the policies going to look like? Well, here's a scoop. I'm going to be attorney general. I'm going to break it right here. I, don't, I didn't tell anyone yet. So I will be named attorney general of the Biden <laughs> administration. So as a Muslim, the first Muslim AG, boom, that changes everything. Look, it's going to be, you see groups no, like it's... Muslim Advocates, a great group, uh, other groups care and others, they want Joe Biden to end the Muslim ban, which I think he's going to do. He has pledged in October to have Muslims in various positions throughout his entire administration. I hope he fulfills that. On policy, look, the Muslim community lines up very clearly with, with most of America. We want health care, we want living wages, you want to deal with climate change. I think it's on foreign policy where we have differences from many in the Biden administration. I mean, I recall in the run-up of the campaign having a chat online with Tony Blinken, who is now Secretary of State nominee, and we had a joint conversation about what will he do to stand up to Israel building settlements? Will they withhold funding? And they said, absolutely not. They're not going to withhold aid to Israel to make them do things. So you're like, then what exactly will they do in terms of foreign policy? I think domestic policy, it lines up really well. Because it'll be center left, and I think the Muslim communities in general now in America, okay. center, center left on that. A foreign policy, I, I think we're going to still have some disappointment. We're going to have to push hard. Okay. Issues of concern. We'll, we'll have to leave it there. Dean Obedullah, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.